My name is Francesca Thiessen Bonamita, and I'm the founder and chairwoman of TBA 21. And today I'm really excited because I get to talk to an old friend of mine, Tuan Nguyen Gen from Vietnam. And uh, we've known each other actually quite a few years. How many, how long, Tuan? Since 2015, I would say, maybe. Maybe yeah. before that. And we've been on, on adventures together. We, we actually traveled um, in Papua New Guinea together, which was an extraordinary journey on, on one of the um, current expeditions by the Academy, TBA 21 Academy. And um, we've embarked on this new venture together. I really would like to introduce this incredible artist to those of you who don't know him. Um, he's a member of the Propeller Group, which is uh, a collective based between Los Angeles and, and uh, Vietnam. And, and, and I think this is how most of us know you actually. Um, the project that we're gonna be talking about is one where you've embarked on a solo with us directly. And I would just like to start by, you know, can you situate that? What's the difference of working with a, co a collective and, and how does it feel like going it alone? You've been doing that quite a lot recently. Uh, thank you, Francesca, for the introduction. And it's so good to see you. And I will never forget our trip to Papua New Guinea um, where I got to scuba dive with you. And it was the most spiritual experience I've ever had. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. But um, <clears throat> yeah, the, the Propeller Group. So I co-founded this collective called the Propeller Group in 2006. And the Propeller Group was kind of started as something like an advertising company. We were looking at how media was operating in a space of Vietnam post the lifting of the embargo on Vietnam and what was happening between um, economic development and cultural development and media development. And we were looking at the comparisons and juxtaposing uh, the, the, the traditional strategies of propaganda that had been really kind of prominent here before the influx of, of these big kind of international conglomerates like PepsiCo and Coca-Cola and all the advertising that came with that. And then we were looking at strategies of advertising. And, and these two kind of phenomena were kind of these dichotomies that we were kind of um, exploring within the, the machine of the, the production of, of these ideas, right? So we, we, we we enacted ourselves, we were performing as an advertising company to look at um, that, that history, particularly the history of the Cold War and the different ideologies between communism and capitalism that were kind of being overlapped here uh, in, 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 in that space, in the media space and in the public space. Um, and, and that's what we were doing for, for quite some time. <clears throat> All along, I had been, you know, kind of maintaining an individual practice. Uh, my practice uh, deals very much with this idea of memory and looking at the relationships between memory, history, and, and trauma. Whereas the Propeller Group was looking at the residuals of the Cold War and how the Cold War, the ideologies of the Cold War were still kind of affecting us uh, presently. Um, and there was no kind of space that was more, had more evidence of the, of the, of the contradictions um, that was happening between capitalism and communism than Vietnam at that time. Yeah, I mean, I've been continuing my own work throughout the time and, 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 and different members of the Propeller Group um, have been kind of maintaining their own individual practices uh, in, uh, 2015, uh, I started to kind of get really focused on different sites of migration, particularly after the Vietnam War, there was an exodus of 2 million Vietnamese 
uh, people from the country. And my, my family was one of, you know, the, the several million that escaped Vietnam. And uh, I started to kind of look at the sites of landings, the refugee camps that kind of popped up uh, after 1975. And, and so, it kind of gave me a certain kind of momentum to kind of delve into that, into that space of um, storytelling. And, uh, you know, since 2015, 2016, 2017, I, I got a chance to show one of my video works uh, at the Whitney Biennial. And uh, it's kind of given me this kind of traction to kind of explore memory um, as I've been doing uh, previous to that. Um, you also embarked on, on a project about migration in the Mediterranean as well. Um, and is, is migration a very big subject for you because it's so close to your personal life? You know, I think the migratory body is, is a body where a lot of different um, tensions are enacted. Um, a lot of different traumas happen uh, during migration. Uh, a lot of things that have to do with ideas of memory occur when bodies move across borders, you know, and, and, and I situate a lot of my, my research um, in, in that space. So how do you research? Because when we uh, developed this project with you, you um, were invited to share all your research. And you were really excited about that. You were actually one of the artists that responded so positively to that request because um, you, you put a huge amount of uh, time and research into this and into all your projects, actually. And, um, and, uh, and more and more artists are doing the same. So there is this incredible practice of artistic research, which I'm really interested in. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that and how you work with research. Research is a crucial part of my practice. My practice is very project-based. Um, I tend to find communities uh, that have experienced traumas, mostly associated with, with migration, or I'll, 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 I'll do projects that are kind of based on sites, uh, different sites that have been um, sites of, of trauma and I'll explore the site. Uh, so between a community and a site is, is, you know, is, are, is where my research kind of takes place. Um, I oftentimes try very hard to get the resources and to create the conditions where I can kind of um, spend time with the community or spend time with on the site. Uh, community work, working with communities is, is really important to, to the research. I think there's something about hearing people's stories that gives you another way of understanding uh, history that research through archives and history books does not. Um, I think the way that we process history is always through a personal lens. Um, and it, it kind of gives us, it dimensionalizes the experience of history. We experience history as people. And we, and we tell stories to our younger generation as the people who experienced a very, Specific, specific history through a very specific vantage point. And, and I believe in that. And so a lot of my research is about spending time in, in places and talking to people. And I think, you know, what's amazing about stage is that it allowed me a little bit of time to spend in uh, the central region of Vietnam, where a lot of the effort in um, demining UXOs is taking place. The DMZ is, and the areas around the demilitarized zone that was happening during the Vietnam War is some of the most heavily bombed uh, areas in, in all of history. And you can, you can, you, you don't understand it until you're there. You don't understand it until you're talking to the people and hearing their stories and, and seeing the actual physical trauma that they've experienced through loss of limb, um, loss of lives, um, and, and, and so on and so forth. So I, I think that stage has really given me uh, a kind of 
access to a different level of research in terms of this project. In your in the film that that you produce, that is that is an amazing work that I want to talk uh, you to talk about in a minute. But in your film, one has you found some vintage footage of in your research um, of those navies navy vessels that were shooting these and they were just piled high and shooting them like every few seconds and we're talking about the 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 demining of of one of these and the effort that it takes and you can actually see the weight of it in your in the footage that you shot because actually when you see these old military films it's barely imaginable how massive they are how how huge they are um and i've got another question about that but just how, the fact that you were able to put these two sets of images together where did you find this original footage of um, the american navy i i met a man a specialist um on location there I didn't know. I thought all the bombs were dropped from airplanes. Yeah, me too. I thought all the bombs were dropped from airplanes. And uh, it turns out that um, a lot of the specialists on location there were talking about the U.S. Navy 7th Fleet. And it turns out the 7th Fleet of the U.S. Navy is a really famous and feared Navy naval fleet in all of the world. And they were positioned right outside of Quanxi um, for a very long time. And they, and they did a lot of bombing. Um, so I, I began to do some research about the US Navy 7th Fleet and uh, about this particular, this particular projectile, which is called a 16 inch 50 caliber projectile. And it's shot from these huge cannons that, that are kind of embedded in, in these like large, you know, um, battleships. Um, and I found some of this military, archival military footage from the, um, the US archives. And I was astounded um, because the, the ease at which these one ton projectiles are shot from inside the battleship seemed like, made it seem like these projectiles were extremely light, like, like you're saying, they would shoot out, you know, but the machine, it's a machine, right? Like they, it's automated. And, and that's what was astounding. They, they shot tons of these uh, for years. And then to juxtapose that with the amount of labor to, that it took to get rid of one yeah. in present day was, was something that just kind of, when you put those two together, it just, gives you a, a kind of sense of how much money is put into military funding. And then now how much money we need to kind of raise to get rid of the UXO that are still there 50 years later. It's, I don't know, it's, it's both fascinating and, and um, haunting at the same it's time. You, you know, you're putting these, juxtaposing these things for me actually put, gave me a lot of perspective on this um, because the randomness of which how they shot them and the little plane that goes up in front and the hit and miss. But one of the parts of your story really interested me, which was the fact that actually maybe there was um, an anti-war Navy soldiers on those ships that deliberately didn't charge them. And that's why so many of them didn't go off. So in, in a sense, what they're doing is trying to remove now these bombs that didn't explode, but were actually part of the anti-war movement back during the war. Could you expand on that? Because I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, no, that's a conversation that I overheard um while we were on this mission to defuse the uh, 16 inch 50 caliber projectile. And it just kind of blew my mind. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about this idea of forgiveness. You know, a lot of, you know, we, we did a podcast with um, a Vietnam War vet named Chuck Searcy who started Project Renew, another non-NGO that removes um, UXO last night. And um, 
he was just talking about the, the forgiveness when Vietnam War vet, veterans come back and they, they, they get this overwhelming sense that um, the, the, the people of Vietnam have, have forgiven um, the atrocities that were, that were made. But uh, you, when, I, when I hear this story, when I heard this story by some of the specialists, you know, it's, it's all speculation, right? You, you, we really don't know, but yeah. it, it opens up the conversation a little bit. It, it opens up this idea of hope and kind of resistance within the machine that, that, that we see in, in screen one, this machine that just is a machine of destruction, which is the US military. Um, and so I thought that was, that was kind of brilliant, you know, and, and, and part of me is skeptical, but part of me finds that, that sense of hope and resistance um, very kind of uh, brilliant, fascinating. Discussing this piece, you always refer to it as part of a healing process. And in fact, when we were having the discussing the threads of how you would participate in stage and how stage is organized, you choose chose one of the interesting topics, which actually I coined, I'm rather proud of, which is trailblazing into the unknown. So I was really happy you picked my topic. <laughs> it's actually been a really popular one. Um, could you sort of go into that a little bit and, and, and tell us why that was important to you? Yeah, I mean, you know, when my work is, is so much about trauma and memory and history, um, but, you know, so much of it is about the other side of trauma. Like, what, what do we do after the trauma? How do we maintain our, our sense of self our self determinacy our sense of hope, um, and how do we empower? How do we empower ourselves? Um, I think healing is a good word. A, a lot of artists talk about this idea of repair, which I think is 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 also really kind of important and and, and crucial in in the larger conversation, um, especially within a post colonial context. Colonialism, as we know, has kind of decimated so many cultures and so many lands and so many resources and, and so many peoples. Um, I, I saw a lot of empathy when I was in, in, in Kwangchi doing, doing this project. I saw, I met with a lot of young people who had lost limbs from cluster munitions. Um, and I, and I think of this idea of repair and I, and I think sometimes it feels quite impossible to repair something that's been decimated. Like, how do you, sorry, I'm getting a little bit emotional, but how do you repair something that's been completely destroyed? Like we, there's prosthetics, there's all this, you know, NGO help, but there is no repair for, for that. It's just, um, it's, it's a different process of healing. It's, it's, it's constructing a, a whole new world out of something that's not there. Um, and I think that kind of speaks to the resilience of, of, of uh, people who have experienced war and especially people in this, in this area. I think another thing that I saw that was quite amazing was people were using bombshells as flower pots, as temple bells as you know like decoration around their house and and that struck me as like this this way of kind of dealing with the trauma in in a very kind of constructive way um and uh i mean i, I think that's my 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 kind of approach to this idea of healing um I, um, it's a bit my cue to talk about my experience 20 years ago. Around 20 years ago today, around this time, um, I took um, a group of conservation supporters and, um, and, and actually my son, who was four at the time, uh, to Laos and Myanmar. And uh, we went down the Mekong River. We did a lot of the sites, but we also went to the Valley of Jars, 
which in Lao is an interesting historical site that nobody really knows what, what it is um, and what these jars were made for and why. They're massive jars carved out of granite lying in a field. And there, there were lots of Uxo around this area. And there, this group, I believe it was the same Mag guys that had just come there. And they, they were demining that area that we'd gone to. And there's a, there was a small hotel w which we all stayed in because this is an important visit visited site. And um, they took us into the field and they showed us their work a bit like what you did. And we had raised $10,000 for their program um, to sort of demine that area. And um, I was also given the privilege of, of, of blowing up one of the mines in, on the field and, you know, experiencing firsthand what all of this meant. And we were having a drink at the hotel and the bar at the hotel, which we were all clustered around after a long dusty day and grabbing our gin tonics, was um, had all these little mini bomblets because they're in Laos, which was more this dumping of all of this arsenal on its way back from flyovers to Vietnam, they were flying over Laos and they were dropping Laos. I mean, when you fly over Laos still today, you just see these pockets of mines of bombs that are just, it's insane. And you can, the scars of which you still can see today where nothing has grown back. Anyway, these, these, they were dry, they're dropping a lot of phosphor bombs there and also these mini bomblets. So that would be a big bomb carrying a lot of little bombs that would scatter over a huge area. And so those were really, really difficult. And those are the ones that were about. And we, we, th these little baby bomblets were used as to put tea candles in all the way around the bar. 15 minutes later, having diffused a live bomblet, which was had a little tea candle on it. And he, he just was scanning them. And the time it took the guy to make the gin tonics, he'd recognized one of them was still alive. You know, in a tourist bar. So, and, and all over Vientiane and all these places, you see these bars and it's, it's, it makes me a bit sick because they're these, they're called the B-52 bars and, you know, it's like the tourist attraction in town and they're, they're all made of bits of airplanes, bits of tank and lots of bones. And there's this kind of war tourism, which I really despise, I have to say. Um, but I mean, it was just that we I'd, I'd been involved in, in an action and raised money for and, and done similar work back 20 years ago. And I, I was so excited when you took on this topic because it's something that I felt was sort of then I'd left behind and it was an opportunity to remind ourselves of, of as you say, the memory and um, you know this incredible healing that needs to take place. And very sadly, when we got to the airport to leave, there was a kid who's, who'd lost an arm and a leg that day. And there was no priority to get him to Vinchan to the hospital. And, you know, we were all ready to give up our places and our seats and, and make sure this kid made it on the next flight, but they wouldn't have it. And um, he did take a flight just before ours at the end. And I went to the hospital to find out how he had gotten along and I ran into his mum and he hadn't made it. And that was really put in, you know, he was just a couple of years older than my son who was with us. And um, it's just so tragic that this is affecting children in particular who, who don't know what these things are. So anyway, that, those are my memories and, and they are very, very heartfelt as well. So bringing this up again is, is really important to me as well. And before we hang up there, there's one important part of the memory is there's this song that accompanies the piece and it's called The Sounds of Cannons, familiar like sad refrains. I won't read out the, Viet the Vietnamese version of it, but um, it plays a very important part in the memory of Vietnamese people looking back at the war. Could you tell us about also the musical score that you've got in the piece? I'm just still thinking about your experience in the bar. <laughs> that's, that's so insane. <laughs> you, you know, the, the US engaged in this, this, this war they called the secret war, where they, they bombed the hell out of Laos because the Ho Chi Minh Trail that was bringing 
um, supplies from the north to the south to the guerrilla fighters uh, went through Laos and they, and, and they bombed Laos because they tried to destroy the Ho Chi Minh Trail, they tried to destroy the supply line. So, so Laos became, yeah, one of the most highly bombed places per capita in the world. That's, I, oh, yeah. And, and children, uh, because of these cluster munitions that you're talking about, these bombies, um, when you activate it, it explodes and all these little pellets, they, they, they get sprayed over like a 10 meter radius. And that's what destroys the limbs of children because children see these and they think they're, they're balls and they're toys. So, so children pick them up and they, they play with them. And, you know, 40,000 people have died since the end of the war from UXO. And if you think about that number and you compare it to the number of US casualties, I think the US had 53,000 casualties. American soldiers died during the war. 40,000, which is almost that number, have died since peace happened, <laughs> have died during the time of peace because of UXOs. It, 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 it kind of boggles my mind. But I, I'll, I'll use that as a segue to, to talk about this song. It, it's a song. Um, it's called Lai Bak Du Dem, and the title of the song is actually the sounds of cannons um, as a lullaby in the night. And it, it was released in 1967 by a singer-songwriter named Jit Gong Sung. Now, Jit Gong Sung is a, is a very important character uh, in that period of time. He was anti-war. He was an anti-war singer-songwriter. And so many of his songs were censored during that time by the government in the South because they believed his songs were making people not want to engage in this war. And we have to remember that it was a civil war. Um, it, was a, it was a war between the North of Vietnam and South of Vietnam. Uh, and there, there's a kind of magic to the way that Jin Kong Sung talks about what he sees during the war, but he doesn't put blame on anybody. And this is something that um, one of my friends uh, last night in the podcast talks about. There's no blame, but there's the sense of overwhelming compassion um, from his kind of observations of the war and his desire to kind of spread this message, uh, this anti-war message. Um, it's, it's a song that has lived in the hearts of people since 1967. In 1968 was one of the, one of the largest bombing campaigns that happened in Quang Chi. Uh, and this is called the Easter Offensive. Um, and for, I can't remember the exact number of days, um, I think 70 days, there was continuous bombing uh, in this area. And so, you know, that proximity of time is something that I, I found interesting. Um, and the lyrics of that song spoke very specifically to cannons, which uh, coincidentally was the, the, the mission that I got a chance to take part of, part of with, with Mag. Um, when I was there in Quang Chi, every 30 minutes I would hear an explosion. And this is the kind of amount of activity in demining that was happening from various teams um, throughout the region. And I could only imagine what it must have sounded like in 1967 to have inspired Jin Kong Sang to write this song. Um, so the film is kind of, kind of chaptered in three sections, right? The first section is kind of the voice. Um, it's, it's propaganda material from the US Navy, the US military. And it kind of heroicizes the US Navy's Seventh Fleet. The second part of the, the film um, is spoken from the perspective of the bomb. So th through these kind of very kind of local ideas of animism that all objects have spirits, we, we hear what the bomb has to say. And then the third part of the, the film is spoken from the point of view of the song, the singer songwriter. Um, and, and it's, it's, it's this way of kind of mem mem it's remembering that kind of time period from 
a very specific perspective, which is a perspective of someone on the ground kind of wishing uh, that another reality would happen, a reality of peace and not a reality of war that he was saying. I mean, I'm so focused on the idea of the symbol of peace at the moment because I looked, I looked it up recently and it's, it's, a, it's a phenomenon that that symbol of peace um, has actually not been picked up again, even by fashion designers in the last, you know, decades since the, you know, the, it represented so much during the hippie movement and the, the revolution against the war in Vietnam. And um, it's, it's such an interesting symbol now, as I see it as something we really need now, again, more than ever, because I feel another very cold war brewing. Um, I feel that we're totally polarized from, you know, extreme positions and getting wider. And also, I think we need to establish peace with nature. I mean, these are the, the, the prerequisites of our survival in the future. And, um, and I've been playing and toying with the idea of working on this peace symbol and, and making it relevant again. And, and, you know, because I think it was so loaded from that period that somehow no one, and it sort of graphically had a very strong image and a, a very specific aesthetic. So I'd love to work with you on this because I think this is something that we need to revisit. And it is something that, and also as I see your work, you know, this is, this is not a trip down nostalgia lane. It is a really interesting new film and a new way of working for you as well. And that I that I can see, and um, as as all the works on stage are accompanied by this uh, variety of, of clusters of, of research and, and calls calls for action and so on. One of the big truths of this is that the artists retain ownership of the work, which is not always very clear, and that is we're just sort of projecting a very beginning of, of something for you because you've been talking about how you want to grow the idea. And um, I'd really like to hear if you're willing to tell us, you know, share with us, how do you imagine this going forward and how would you like to sort of develop the work further? Because I'm really interested in that story. Yeah, I mean, as, as an artist who is really kind of, fascinated with, with narrative and storytelling, and also fascinated with the relationship between narrative and object. I got really focused on, on, on how people were using this material, the, the bombshells, the leftover actual metal from, from uh, that, that embodies, that holds this memory of war, right? Um, in, in my proposal, I talk about how after the war, there was there was not very much opportunity for people to 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 make money. So people would go out and diffuse these bombs themselves um, and sell the scrap metal to to make money, to earn a living, and to put food on their tables. Um, it's still happening now, uh, but there are other stories like there's a temple in Guangbin, which is near this area that we're talking about, the DMZ area, where in 19, I think in 1967, two bombs from a B-52 were dropped in that area. The first bomb uh, destroyed the facade of this temple. The second bomb didn't detonate. So the, uh, the uh, head of the temple saw this bomb as a, as a com compassionate bomb, a bomb that didn't want to kind of engage in the killing of sentient beings. So what he did to honor the bomb and the compassion of the bomb was to make it into a temple bell. And I thought that was an incredible story, you know, how this, th there's this idea of the karma of materials, right? Materials holding this kind of karma um, that's embedded in the story. And so what, we've been doing is we've been working with some uh, people who have been kind of collecting the scrap metal material from from bombs 
And uh, we're working with a specialist who kind of makes these instruments that kind of emanate a healing frequency for sound healing. He makes these beautiful wind chimes. So we're turning these bombs and we're kind of um, embedding them with healing frequencies so that when you play it, it emits a certain kind of uh, decibel and a frequency that kind of research shows that heals different parts of your body and your mind. Um, so that's one of the things that we're kind of engaging in. Um, and I think, you know, several more video projects. I think there's, there's so much uh, to unravel and to kind of wrap our heads around in this topic. And, and there's, there's a large community that, that are ready to tell their stories. And uh, I am imagining like a two or three year kind of engagement with this community to kind of continue making projects with them. That's amazing. Well, I'm. I've heard that you're back down in a in a really bad lockdown, um, and I'm I'm really sorry to hear that. It looks bad for us here in Europe as well. So, your invitation to come to Vietnam and experience this all firsthand is maybe postponed, but not indefinitely, because um, this is also interesting for me to go full circle with this and and to pick up these projects and you know the idea of of bell sounds or singing bowls and the sacredness but Tuan it's wonderful to speak to you again and and I was worried today that I was thinking about this and you're thinking about that we're actually completely in tune um, when talking about these things these very important elements of healing um, of reparation of renewal um, which are all things that um, somehow the, the, the pandemic has highlighted, but these are all elements that you've been thinking about for a very long time. And I think in your practice has gotten very, very beautiful and very deep into these very important topics. And it would really be our pleasure to continue working with you. Again, thank you, TBA21 and, and the team at Stage. What a wonderful team. It's been a pleasure to work with with everybody there. Uh, thank you and. <laughs>